as a data scientist, what we do typically, uh, probably a decade ago, uh, when we were building models, machine learning models, uh, those were more of proof of concepts. You will uh, write, uh, start writing a code from scratch, or probably borrow it from a colleague. You do your typical data ingestion, data processing, uh, EDA, feature selection, model training, and so on. And once done, you are set with the model. Uh, the next step now, though, is you, know, you also want to deploy your models. Uh, so you bring an ML engineer, deploy your model. Uh, once you deploy the model, what happens is you have to also build inference pipelines to run the model for prediction on your data. Now to do all of this right, you could be using some of the open source tools. Uh, some of them have some features that I explained. But imagine you have to do it at scale, at an enterprise level. So what I'm talking about is a platform uh, that Tiger has. It's the Tiger ML Core platform. Uh, this platform enables end-to-end -end development, automation, and observability. Um, I'm using these specific terms here, and uh, that's how conceptually we'll write to break down this platform. Right? So the platform is an enterprise solution, uh, which I can break as uh, code templates for the development part, the ML ops for the automation part, and the observability layer for observability and monitoring. So uh, and let me go through these one by one. So code templates are pre-built solution templates for specific use cases. Uh, so what you see here, for example, is uh, for regression or forecasting, market mix, straight from optimization. Uh, but as I speak, uh, we have been using uh, this platform across several large organizations and clients. And as newer codes keep getting developed, uh, the code templates uh, repository is expanding. Once the codes are built, right? so the code templates are there, you can start using it. The second thing would be the MLOps part. Uh, you want to automate everything uh, from your development to production, right? The DevOps pipeline, CI, CD, and MLOps, that will automate everything. Every, anytime your team makes changes, everything gets registered in the Bitbucket or Git repo and gets transferred uh, to, to production, right? Now, the codes take care of automating uh, the code part. The MLOps take care of automating it to production. ML observability layer uh, takes care of observing and monitoring. Now that's, in fact, is one of the most important thing when we want to scale and uh, scale our models at an enterprise level, right? There could be thousands of models which are in your organization, and hence you want to observe and monitor all of them. We have an observability layer which essentially registers all the artifacts of the model, right? It could be different drifts, it could be around your expiratory analysis and so on. A monitoring layer which takes care of monitoring end-to-end, -end, right? From development, in fact, to the MLOps, and even post-deployment. And you have ML support and site reliability, which takes care of uh, uh, tracking your cost and consumption and uh, other such metrics. Right. This is the end-to-end -end, uh, suite of features and capabilities available in the ML Core platform. Uh, it's a lot of things, but as you can see, this essentially transcends all the layers of your ML lifecycle from data ingestion to model development, uh, evaluation, deployment, and retaining, and so on. Uh, I'll quickly probably cover some aspects of, of uh, the capabilities. So data ingestion, you have uh, uh, data ingestion possible from different data sources. The platform itself is uh, cloud agnostic. So we have used the platform across clients on Azure, GCP, and uh, AWS as well. So you could do ingestion from different, cloud, different data sources. Uh, you could look at different previews of the data. Uh, the EDL lets you do driver analysis, correlation analysis, bivariate uh, health reports on the data. All of the reports are downloadable and are auto-generated in the platform. Uh, the feature engineering module lets you build DAGs, codeless DAGs, notebook DAGs, right? So you can essentially do drag and drop and uh, tell the platform this is how you want your DAG of the process to, to look like, right? Say a data engineering DAG, followed by, so you could have a raw data and uh, you could build DAGs which will specify what kind of feature transformation you want to apply. There are also time series toolkit for time series forecasting. You have inbuilt transformers to allow you to do all sort of feature engineering. Uh, in model development, uh, you have auto ML with all possible algorithms, deep learning, traditional ML, uh, hyperparameter tuning is possible across uh, for, for different, with different algorithms. Uh, on model evaluation, you have SHAP, feature importance, uh, feature importance based on different algorithms again. On model deployment, you can do codeless deployment, batch, API. Uh, there is model interaction also allowed. In fact, the plot platform, if, even if you do not want to do a deployment, for example, what platform will allow you to do in some sort of a scenario planner. So you could, uh, for example, pass values for all the features uh, that the model was trained on, and it will give you the final outcome. 
So that interaction is also possible. Um, on model monitoring, you have uh, different kind of drifts, feature, concept, target, and so on. Uh, there are multiple algorithms supported uh, for drifts. Uh, you can configure them based on thresholds also. And finally, the retrain part. Uh, the platform itself gives you recommendations on model retraining. And uh, of course, based on the monitoring report, you can decide when you want to retrain. Uh, in general, across all the layers, there is also uh, ML governance, right, which is available. And when I say governance, what it means, you as a lead um, in, in data science, right, you could have a team who is building models. So like I said, code templates will take care of the part of building models, right, till model development. But beyond that, when you want to take the model into production, you need to ensure that the models that are developed are correct and are accurate on different dimensions. So the governance part, in fact, lets you do a workflow approval. There are inbuilt reports, uh, for example, a bias and fairness testing report, the model testing report, which I'll cover in the subsequent slides and so on. And you can decide to approve, reject them, and then only the model goes into production, right? Uh, we also have alerts and notifications. You can set policies based on which you will get alerts on emails, and you can again set workflows there. Uh, there is authorization and access, depending on, on your, in your organization, you can decide uh, which teams can have access to which repositories, which teams can have access to which projects. As DS leadership, someone in the leadership in your organization could decide to have access to everything, for example, and so on. So that was more of a view on uh, all the possible capabilities that Tiger ML Core platform has. Uh, this is a quick glimpse on uh, how the life cycle looks like in ML, right, and how these different artifacts are captured as part of each phase in the ML life cycle. So we start with data preparation, where you have the EDA and data quality checks, uh, the feature engineering, and then model development, where uh, the platform captures what features are selected on what basis, uh, what hyperparameters were used to tune the model. In model evaluation phase, it captures bias and fairness based on, uh, again, it's customizable on what features you want to use. Model explainability, SHAP, uh, different algorithms as available. Model and data testing, uh, and again, drift-based drift uh, metrics. Uh, once the model is deployed, you have model serving available, batch, API, whatever way. You can look at resource consumption, you can look at uh, inference pipelines, success and failure rate, you can log anything around monitoring and inferencing. All of that uh, goes through the yellow box, the, the center, right? The model performance monitoring, which is a feedback to your feature engineering and model development. This is a typical, typically how your ML lifecycle looks like. Uh, a bunch of uh, additional observability metrics I'll cover here. Uh, there are job pipeline metrics, which essentially cover the compute and RAM metrics. Uh, when, if, if you deploy an ML Core, Tiger ML Core kind of a platform in your organization, one thing you would want to know is how is the CPU and RAM usage across clusters, across jobs, across teams, right? Uh, that, that's the partition which is available. You also can do cost attribution, right? You can associate tags, uh, uh, you know, which the, like Databricks allows you to associate tags to different clusters, which will let you again decide how much cost is attributed to which jobs and which uh, teams uh, in your organization. Uh, there are also alerts and policies. Uh, so you could set up policies, for example, in, in your monitoring jobs, right? Uh, you can decide, for example, I have a certain model which is running, uh, which has shown me a 10% MAPE, right, when I train the model. But when you are monitoring, you want to ensure that it doesn't go beyond the 20 percent maybe, right? So what you would want to do is, you could say, for example, that I want to set a policy where the MAPE for this model should not exceed 20 percent for three or five consecutive runs. Again, customizable. And if that happens, then you get alerts uh, for you, right? So the platform also has an issue dashboard. Uh, all of these, when I talk about in terms of metrics, there are views for data scientists and also views at an enterprise level. So the issues, alerts, policy violations are all captured as part of those dashboards. So I was speaking about the features um, of the platform. Now why uh, this platform works very well uh, for our clients? Because it introduces a federated MLOps uh, framework here, right? Uh, and maybe instead of calling it a framework, it's, a, it's an actual uh, implementation that we have done. So imagine in your organization, you have uh, multiple DS teams, right? Four DS teams for illustration here, who will be working in their own workspaces. So they can inherit the code template that I spoke about. They can start using them immediately and uh, then push them, right, with whatever logic changes they have and push them to a UAT or prod environment. What happens from there on is 
the observability and consumption layer, right? The monitoring, experiment tracking, explainability, everything. That is done through a centralized workspace. So the MLOps here is happening from individual teams' workspace to the centralized workspace. To the centralized workspace, right? Uh, so here, like for example, in case of Azure, let's say, right? So each team will have their own data, their own codes in their workspaces, which gets written into a Unity catalog, right? Data, features, everything. And then there is a centralized workspace, Databricks and MLflow, where the ML core platform sits, everything is captured there, the web app, web app, the UI, and all the observability happens from there. So the user, be it a data scientist, a DS manager, leadership, ML engineer, a support engineer, you could have a reliability engineer for that matter. All of them have to consume everything around observability and monitoring only through the central workspace. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, walk you through some of the platform services uh, with deep dive into uh, what we touched upon already in the previous slides. I'll start with the code templates. Uh, so I was already emphasizing on why code templates uh, is, has been super useful, right, in, in uh, Emrecall platform. So code templates are pre-built templates, solution templates for specific use cases. Now these are, these templates do not provide just the code bases, right? So they will give you the code base, but there are some specific salient features around these code bases. So for example, it gives you project organization as well. Why do you need to have a utils folder, right? Why, how do you want to organize your raw data versus the engineered data, right? How do you want to put the artifacts of the model, right, at different stages? So the project organization comes inbuilt as part of the code template. The other thing is uh, the codes are very well structured in terms of uh, being production ready. They, are, they have uh, documentation available, inline documentation. Uh, logging is inbuilt in all the code bases. Uh, you get uh, reference notebooks with all the documentation, like I said. Uh, the code templates also come with review and testing guidelines. So you could have a team, uh, a few data scientists, right, who might be writing production code for the first time. They do not have to worry about you know, probably doing a Google search to do that. They can take code templates. All of the testing and review and all guidelines on organization come inbuilt. They can start using it. Any changes they want to make in logic, any business changes they want to make, they can make it and then follow the guidelines, right? With whatever changes you want to make, your codes are still production ready. And the last thing is documentation. Uh, Sphinx based documentation again comes inbuilt as part of uh, the code templates. Uh, what we have seen across clients is these code templates are very, very easy to get started. And at least a 50% has started on project. And you would imagine from what I explained, a lot of the heavy lifting is already done by the code templates when it covers uh, the documentation, testing, review, uh, production readiness, and all. Uh, now, once you have the code templates ready, you essentially have your model build done, right? Because it takes care of your exploratory work, feature engineering, selection, and model development. Now, from there on, there are a lot of platform services which takes care of the observability, explainability, and monitoring part. Uh, so what you see here on this chart here is one illustration on SHAP-based analysis, right? On the right side, you have a feature contribution from SHAP. And uh, the, the rightmost image is the sharp value distribution based on the low and high of the features itself, right? Now, these are illustrative in nature, but if you see on the left in the legend, uh, the platform gives you a lot of different, ob uh, different options here. You could look at error analysis based on sharp, uh, actual versus predicted residual analysis. You could do feature importance again from sharp or from any algorithm, right? random forest based feature importance and so on. Uh, and you can do sharp interpretation at a feature level, right, for each feature. Beyond that, the SHAP interpretation will also give you SHAP interaction. So you could look at, uh, uh, for, for a range of values for a given feature, first of all, the SHAP that it corresponds to, but also interaction with other variables of interest, right? And that interaction gives a lot of information as you would have probably also used in your DS journey. Now, once that explainability part is covered, <coughs> the other thing as a team that you would want to do is do a model and data testing. Uh, this is something which is quite unique to this platform and uh, some of the clients that we have uh, implemented the platform for, this has come out to be very handy. So what you see on the right side is a bunch of tests which are inbuilt to the platform and again they are customizable, user can bring in their own tests. The top part is a set of so some of the tests, uh, you know, with this illustrative example, this model did not pass. And on the bottom are some tests which the model was able to pass. So the test could be, for example, uh, let's say you want to ensure that your test set is not less than 1% of your train set. And that's a valid test you would want to ensure it's a mandate. 
Uh, another test could be that you do not want any two features which have more than, say, 80 or 90 percent correlation. Right? Uh, one test could be that your model might be performing at, let's say, 10 percent maybe, right? But if you look at different segments of your data, some segments might be performing very bad. There again, you can put a test, right? You do not want the weakest segment to be performing as bad as certain threshold, right? You do not want the weakest segment to be performing or giving you, say, 100 percent maybe, right? If that happens, uh, you will find that this model or data did not pass the test, and hence it gets captured here. This is something we have found very, very useful because often when we take our models to production, uh, these come into light later on, and we realize that you know some part of the data were not captured rightly. They could not pass some of these tests. And if it is taken care here, right, before we go into production, the developer can easily identify what's going wrong with the data and the model. Now, once uh, the extendability is done, you have model and data testing is done. What you want to do next is uh, take your model of deployment. Now, before you take the model of deployment, what I spoke of earlier was the approval and governance part. The platform allows you, say, as a lead, that when your team generates some of these reports on bias and fairness, model testing, and model evaluation, you can choose to approve or reject them. And these reports are uh, all automated on the platform and get generated and triggered as part of the CI CD, right? Now, what I'm showing here is a deployment monitor at the top. So once, uh, as a lead, you have approved some of the reports, um, in fact, you can again customize it, right, for your needs, which all report you want to, you want the lead to approve before it can actually be staged for deployment. So once the model is staged for deployment, then the deployment, uh, the batch or API is on a click of a button, right? What you see here is an inference job. So deployment is done. Now you want to start inferencing it on the new data. New data right? It could be an hourly inference, daily inference, monthly inference, depending on how frequent data comes. So what you see here on the right is a run status. So I have set an inference job, and it's running, let's say, every day. So the green boxes there indicate that last five or 10 runs have been successful. Uh, you also see monitoring and actions there at the end. The monitor essentially lets you do perform model monitoring starting from here. The actions let you configure it. So in this inference job, if I want to perform model monitoring based on any KPI that I want, it could be performance uh, measurement, it could be a data drift concept, target drift, or anything, I can go to actions and I can configure them. The kind of actions allowed are, for example, you can choose which uh, performance metric you want to use for performance measurement, right? MAP, R square, S MAP, uh, W MAP, anything. You could, if you want to do a feature-based data drift, you can even decide which features you want to use for that, right? You could have 20 features in your model, but you can decide that, hey, I want to use these 10 features, right, to do data drift on. And at each feature level, you can even configure it which KPI, which metric you want to use, right? A KS, a KL divergence or a PSI index, and in fact, the threshold also. You could put different threshold for, for different features. Now, once you said that, there are automated reports that the platform generates. Uh, these reports are based on, uh, the platform generally identifies these four kinds of uh, 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 drifts, right? The performance, data drift, concept, and target drift. What you see on the right side, for example, is the, the first figure on the top, right? Uh, the red colored one is the MAP, which is varying across different inference runs, inference jobs, and the blue line is the reference. So this is where you could, for example, set up a policy. Right, if I was talking about earlier, right? <clears throat> if, the, if the MAPE drops below the reference value uh, for three or five or 10 consecutive runs, you could set an alarm for that. On the bottom, what you see is a data drift at a feature level. So the green bar tells you uh, what's the reference value, let's say for the PSI index, and the blue uh, bar tells you what was the PSI index for three different inference jobs. And again, like I mentioned, depending on what kind of policy you want to set, you could mention that uh, if uh, once, twice, or n number of times, if the PSI index has been breached, it can trigger an alert. A lot of this, like I said, is already uh, inbuilt to the platform. Everything is customizable, and you can configure it going to the threshold level and the feature level. Now, once you have set those monitoring, uh, model monitoring jobs, it will start monitoring at uh, daily and weekly, uh, whatever level you want to do. The one thing that you want to know as a data scientist is, imagine there is a drift which is detected, right? So you know that 
you know that uh, certain uh, feature or the, the certain model has a drift coming in. We are talking now about explainability on the monitoring side, right? It's not model explainability, it's monitoring explainability. So for example, the chart that you see, the first chart on the left, uh, what you see here is the kernel density estimator for generating the PDF uh, between the current value and the reference value. So it will give you, so the platform will give you uh, the probability density functions across all the features comparing the reference value and the current value. You can look at across features, you can use what time frame you want to look for. You also can generate the histograms and the frequency plots for the categorical features. Now, having done the monitoring part, the, the, the platform now also incorporates the LLM monitoring. Uh, for any LLM models that you have, the platform performs the monitoring uh, across different dimensions as you see here. Uh, it can do a monitoring on cost based on how many tokens are being passed by the user, uh, correctness on the accuracy, how correct uh, is the answer from the LLM to the question on the prompt, uh, the bias with respect to gender and race, etc. cetera. Uh, A-B testing, right? You can even check how deterministic uh, your LLM model is, right, by passing similar prompt to the model multiple times. So it can check, it can even change, it can even check, right, uh, if there is a changes in the LLM model by comparing different models. Um, it also looks at the quality, right, uh, the length of prompt, how many tokens are going in the prompt, what's the vocabulary, are there any non-character or non-letter characters in the prompt which are being passed. And finally, it looks at the safety and security also. Uh, if the LLM is passing any toxic or negative comments, or even the user is asking for this, right? So we, we could do an aspect-based sentiment analysis in the back end, in the platform, and that way it, will, it can gauge and measure if there is any negative comment. Uh, yeah, so I, I spoke of uh, a data scientist journey, uh, which is essentially what a data scientist would do across all the different phases of the platform that I spoke about. But then the platform is not just meant as a DS workbench, right? That's not the purpose. That's only one part of it. The, the way we have uh, implemented and deployed this platform across clients is as an enterprise solution. So you could have different personas in your organization, uh, a data scientist, which we spoke of, a DS leadership, the ML support team, and the site reliability team. For different user personas, there are so many different views that cater to their uh, requirement, right? The DS leadership, for example, may not be interested in, in uh, looking at every single monitor monitoring. They may not want to look at the feature importance, right? But what they might want to look at is, in general, at an overall level, how many models do I have, right? And how many models are in monitoring? So let me give you a quick glimpse on that, the so user journey. The user journey for a DS leadership could take multiple routes. And for example, one route could be, they want to look at, <coughs> sorry, they want to look at the enterprise view. So at the top, what you see is the enterprise view, which is available as part of the platform. So it will show you how many models are there in the organization, how many models are being monitored currently in production, and so on. How many models are healthy or not healthy, and so on. The second, the second part of the user journey for leadership could be to look at the model explainability for some of the models of interest. Right? The leadership might know which models are critical to the organization, and they can go and check their explainability through the reports. And then they can look at the model testing reports as well. Right? Uh, support ML engineer, uh, so, so when we deploy these models, we have this concept of having uh, not just a DS uh, manager or DS leadership, we also uh, accompany a concept of having a support ML engineer and a reliability engineer. The terminology may not necessarily hold good for specific uh, people, but uh, it's more in terms of the usage, right? You could have support ML, support ML engineer who will cater to the different issues on the dashboard, uh, the platform. Like I spoke of, uh, the platform has an issue dashboard. Uh, the dashboard will list down all the issues. It could be with respect to some platform malfunction. It could be with respect to some policy violation. It could be with respect to some alerts generated as part of the model management. So this is the user journey which can, which can take place through that, right? You could have, so the, the ML engineer can look at the cockpit view, right? The entire issue dashboard can drill down to which issues has been assigned to him or her can look into specific issues and understand if it needs support from the ML engineer or is the DS team that has to support. Come down, ticket creation, you know, create a remedy either from ML engineer or from the DS team, and then look at the analytics. So at the end, the ML engineer can in fact look at the analytics of how frequently the issues are coming, which projects are more issue prone, 
uh, which teams are able to create remedies and so on, right? So there is complete analytics can be done on top of the issues as well. Then another uh, user journey for uh, SRE and resource monitoring. Um, so one of the important com component of uh, the platform is the users can look at, uh, like I said earlier, CPU and RAM usage uh, by cluster, by team, uh, by jobs, as well as cost attribution, right? DS leadership, of course, would be interested in to look into that, right, in your organization. Uh, which project teams are incurring how much cost, right? Which jobs are taking up a lot of cost, and so on. So for an SRE engineer, the person can drill down, again, look at the enterprise view of uh, the resource monitoring, again, drill down into the specific uh, jobs, specific teams that he or she is interested in, right? The drill down, the drill down can happen, and then uh, they can look at the CPU RAM usage by project, by job, and at the end, they can look at the aggregated dashboard of the monthly and time series view as well. I'll close uh, this, this presentation with one final functional view of uh, how the platform looks like. On the right side, you have the different personas that I spoke of. So everyone starts with a web app. There is an entire web application that the user, that's the only interactive uh, thing that user has to do, uh, and no notebooks or codes required. The web app calls REST API, which in, in, in turn calls all the different services as part of the platform. There's the platform DB that the REST API calls, which captures all the data. At the bottom, what you see is the MLOps layer, which orchestrates with respect to the specific project repository. All of this is done for a user only through a web, app, uh, web application. And uh, this is something we have implemented across various clients who have been able to run successfully across the enterprise right, to run and do all model management. Um, yeah, that's all I had, uh, if any questions. Uh,